Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us um, this afternoon to discuss some interesting insurance developments, which some of you may have been following. Um, it's a slightly different landscape now that we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and today we're going to discuss whether existing insurances cover business interruption losses arising specifically from COVID-19. So just by way of introduction, my name's Lucy Terracol. I'm a partner in the Melbourne office. Um, we also have Fred Hawke, who's a consultant in the Melbourne office. And we're also um, pleased to have Chris Erfurt, who's special counsel in our Brisbane office. Um, by way of housekeeping, to start things off, um, I'd just like to let you know that you can use a toggle at the bottom in the middle of your screen to change the size of the slides and the speaker's video to suit you. In terms of questions, we're more than happy to take questions. Um, please submit your questions through the Q&A function in the Blue Jeans webinar. That can be found on the right of your screen. Um, and also, if there are questions that you pose or have later after the session, um, or questions that you put to us during the session that we don't have time to address, obviously please reach out to any one of us and we're happy to chat chat further with you. So today we will be covering four topics. Um, we'll, I'll be giving a little bit of an introduction to the insurance industry response to COVID-19. Um, then we'll be talking a bit more in detail about the, the cover for business interruption losses. Then we're going to um, have a discussion around the UK test cases that are up and running through the Financial Conduct Authority um, and talk about the framework that they've established in the UK for these test cases and also what we can expect to see out of those test cases. We're also going to touch briefly on the potential for Australian test cases, albeit that we don't have a lot of public information about that yet. So firstly, having a look at the insurance industry response to COVID-19, obviously the scale of the losses caused by the pandemic has taken many policyholders by surprise, and policyholders are turning to insurers to mitigate their losses. Just for a bit of context, in terms of my practice, Chris's practice and Fred's practice, we are a policyholder focused group. In the dispute space, we only act for policyholders, um, and so the, the version of, of the world that we are giving you today is definitely from a policyholder's perspective. Noting, of course, that we have read um, you know, many papers and, and taking note of what the insurance industry's response is. But I just wanted to put that out there so you understand where we're coming from. It's been suggested that the total losses to the insurance industry could actually reach over 200 billion US dollars in 2020. As a result of disruptions caused by COVID-19 to business operations, the insurers of certain types of covers can expect to see significant increases in claims, including covers like workers' compensation or employers' liability, travel insurance, obviously, event liability, um, business interruption, which of course is the focus for today, trade credit insurance, and rent default, among others. Today's presentation will focus on the cover or lack of cover for business interruption losses arising as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. The negative impact of COVID-19 on underwriting and claims handling is likely to put an additional strain on insurers' loss ratios, resulting in premium increases. I understand that for many of you that will come um, as no surprise, but it also is obviously not welcomed off the back of the insurance industry as it stood pre-COVID, which had just been hit by the bushfires. Um, and it's also been impacted significantly by class actions in Australia and general economic um, factors existing all around the globe. So even pre-coronavirus, we're looking at a pretty distressed industry. Um, and adding this on top of it is, is potentially going to push some insurers too far. In the short term, the insurers are likely to continue to receive pressure from consumer groups and some parliamentary bodies to adopt a lenient approach to cover for COVID-19 related loss, losses. In the long term, um, and, and I've certainly already seen this, Fred, Chris and I have seen this in our practice, 
Insurers are likely to revisit their exclusion clauses in respect of pandemics and infectious diseases in the wake of the losses associated with COVID-19. Insurers might actually consider moving to a complete exclusion for communicable diseases or pandemics. And as I said, I've already seen a number of wordings um, on renewal, having very broad COVID-19 exclusions um, inserted on those policies. And that's um, of some concern, considering that um, you know, a lot of the narrative and business decisions at the moment have to necessarily involve considerations of COVID-19. So just moving on to the next slide. So for now, despite all of that doom and gloom, I want to refocus our attention on the business interruption sphere where there remains significant confusion regarding the insurance response. So material damage is obviously the foundation of cover. The sort of cover I'm talking about is property insurance, or many of you will know of the industrial special risks or ISR policy. Taking ISR as an example, section one of ISR is cover for material damage to property, and section two is business interruption cover for losses flowing from the material damage, which is covered under section one. The idea is that to get to your section two business interruption cover, you must go through section one as a gateway and you must have property damage. So often what we see is um, some sort of triggers are physical damage to tangible property being the foundation of these insurance policies. Um, Chris will talk you through a couple of the extensions in these types of policies, which moves the, the cover away from a um, preconceived idea or a, or a foundation of physical damage to tangible property. So there are extensions and of course um, the insurance industry makes that even more interesting by having a carve out within an extension. In other words, an exclusion to the exclusion. The reality for these types of policies, as with every insurance policy, is that no one size um, fits all. So the, the advice we've be, been giving to our corporate policyholder clients is read the policy in detail and if you don't understand it, you take it to your broker and you ask them to explain it to you because there's been a number of instances where policyholders didn't think they had cover and they in fact do. I'll now hand over to Chris Erford in Brisbane who will take us through a few example wordings and explain in further detail the arguments being adopted by the insurance market in denying the BI claims which stem from a pandemic. Thanks, Lucy, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'll speak to two broad topics. Firstly, as Lucy just mentioned, I'll run through a number of extensions that we've seen in policies, some broader, some narrower, um, which may afford cover for COVID-19 business interruption insurance claims. And then secondly, I'll turn to have a brief look at the test case which AFCA announced in the Australian Financial Complaints Authority announced in June um, that it was considering to resolve some of these issues. Um, so firstly, um, as Lucy mentioned, material damage is a general foundation of cover under business interruption insurance, but um, there are a number of extensions available in some policies which provide in principle cover for business interruption losses without the need for physical damage. So this first example we've got up on the slide um, is not one of those covers. Although the concluding words in this example are whether the premises shall be damaged or not, um, you can see from the words which precede that and in particular the ones I've highlighted or underlined that there does need to be damage either to the premises or to property within a 50 kilometre radius of the premises caused by peril that's insured under the policy, which um, will typically be um, you know, fire and other hazards which cause physical damage to property. Um, so this is example one of a prevention of access extension, um, and it's a narrower extension which favours the insurer. Moving on to example two of this extension. You can see from looking at this clause that there does not need to be uh, physical damage as a precondition to cover 
under the extension. Rather, there's two elements to the cover. Number one, there needs to be an order of a legal authority. Um, and in our view, and there's case law which deals what's meant, with what's meant by that, um, the measures which were announced by the federal government on the, which took effect on the 23rd and the 25th of March and, and shut down a number of uh, types of facilities and activities and imposed restrictions on others. Um, and that was generally given effect through, through state law, state and territory law. Um, that will clearly satisfy that first requirement of an order of any legal authority. Um, the second element is that the order must have prevented or hindered the use of the location or access to it. Um, so, for example, the order which took effect on the 23rd of March, if we look at a gym, um, it required the closure of a gym, um, as with pubs and cinemas, um, and also restricted access to places like cafes and restaurants. So, in my view, if that prevented or hindered the use of that location or resulted, on the words of this policy, in a cessation or diminution of trade by diminished custom, that second element will be satisfied. Um, now, in relation to that, insurers might assert that the extension does not apply, either because the order needs to specify uh, or identify a particular location. Um, the words of the policy don't say that or that the order needs to make it physically impossible to access or use the location. Again, the words of the policy don't say that. And it essentially relies on an argument where you're talking about a pub or a gym, et cetera, that the people that were operating it still could have you know, opened the doors and gone in there or people could have um, jumped the fence and, and, and got in there. So it um, seems to me to be not a very good argument um, and importantly um, is not present in the words that are in the wording that's up on the screen there. Moving on to the second of three extensions, which I'll speak to, um, the public authority extension. Um, this is an example of a narrower wording which favours insurers. Um, talks about an interruption or interference arising out of a threat or fear of physical loss or damage. Um, in our view, it's very hard to argue that um, the interruption or interference caused by COVID-19 is due to threat or fear of physical loss or damage because uh, even if the virus can be physically present on surfaces, it's hard to argue that it's physical damage um, when it can be wiped off and there's case law which supports um, that proposition. Moving on to a second and broader more favourable to the policyholder wording. You can see it's, it's similar in terms of uh, speaks of threat or damage to property, but importantly in this example, it also refers to threat, threat of or damage to property or persons. So again, the first requirement is that there's an, a legal authority which has prevented or restricted access. So we've spoken about that already in respect of the prevention of access clause. Um, and the second, requirement is um, that that's because of a threat of damage to persons um, within 50 kilometres and that would seem an apt description of the reason for the orders which closed, for example, gyms and pubs to protect um, the spread of the disease and protect uh, against a threat of damage to persons. Um, again, insurers might assert that the prevention or restriction has to be specific to the insured premises or a 50 kilometre vicinity that a community wide order is not good enough. Um, but again, that seeks, in my view, seeks to read words in the policy which don't exist. And at best um, for insurers, the clause is ambiguous and in those circumstances should be construed contra, contra proferentum or against the drafter, against the insurers. Um, moving on to a third extension, I'll spend slightly more time on this because it's the one which has received the most attention um, and has been or the most or the most controversial and um, which has spurred AFCA to consider running a test case. Um, and that is the infectious disease extension. 
Um, so in this first example, and sorry, I should pause there and, and state that we've seen a, a very wide range of um, extensions and across all three that I've um, that I'll talk have talked about or will talk about, but this one in particular, there, there is a wide variance of wordings. Um, so I'd reiterate Lucy's point that it's very important to, to not make assumptions about the colour that you may or may not have and to scrutinise that and ask your brokers in the first instance to explain the position. Um, so moving back to this first example of an infectious disease extension, um, Although the, uh, the words provide cover for an interruptional interference arising from a closure consequent upon infectious or contagious disease, and in this instance, um, the disease has to have been manifested by a person at the premises. So unless that has occurred in your particular case, um, there won't be any cover in our view on this example. Moving on to a second example, which is brought up in favour of the policyholder. Um, this speaks merely, um, so there's two parts to this. There's the extension, which is the first paragraph or the first two sentences, and then there's a, a right back or what Lucy describes as an exclusion to the extension in the second paragraph. So I'll speak to the first part of it first. Um, an outbreak of a human infectious or contagious disease, well, that will include COVID-19, occurring within a 20 kilometre radius of the situation. Um, so in order to trigger that, it will be necessary to identify an occurrence of uh, COVID-19 within a 20 kilometre radius of the insured premises. So for example, at a nearby hospital or if there's been a case at a nearby pub or something like that. Um, the key point of contention which has come from insurers has been that this right back in the second paragraph applies. Um, and in our view, that's wrong for a couple of reasons. In particular, um, COVID-19 is not avian influenza and nor is it a quarantinable disease. And secondly, the Quarantine Act 1908 was repealed in 2016. So insurers have sought to argue against this by saying that the Biosecurity Act, which came in in 2015, replaced the Quarantine Act, that this qualifies as a, to use the words in that, uh, right back to the extension, a subsequent amendment to the Quarantine Act, and that the concept of what is a listed human disease under the Biosecurity Act is essentially the same as a quarantinable disease under the Quarantine Act. Um, so even if one's prepared to make this series of leaps of logical faith, there's still problems for insurers, and in particular, three things. Firstly, various guides to interpretation say, and the High Court has said that amendment and repeal are distinct concepts, and a repeal and replacement falls outside of the core um, meaning of the word amend. Secondly, in any event, in context, we think this word subsequent means subsequent placement of the policy. Um, and given that the Quarantine Act was repealed in, in uh, 2016 and that relevant policies, if they're on an annual basis, will have been placed in either 2019 or 2020, then that's not going to work. And thirdly, even if subsequent amendments does include the Biosecurity Act, the Biosecurity Act does not have a concept of quarantinable disease. As I mentioned before, it has a concept of listed human disease. Um, insurers have also asserted that the intent of the right back is clear. In my view, that's not relevant and it's also facile. And at best for insurers, the clause is ambiguous and it should be construed contra proferentum against them. So moving on to a third example. A number of insurers have already or since, or sorry, had already prior to COVID-19 or have since the advent of COVID-19 updated their policy wordings to also refer to the Biosecurity Act, incorporate this concept of a listed human disease. And in addition to using the word subsequent amendment, adding the words or replacement thereof and any equivalent legislation. Um, so in my view, this merely serves to reinforce the lack of credibility in the arguments around example two, um, that, that that example operates in this way um, and that the previous wordings were sufficiently clear. Now, moving on to a fourth and final example of the infectious disease extension, 
Um, and this ties together a couple of uh, concepts that we've talked about. So firstly, the outbreak of a human infectious or contagious disease occurring within a 20 kilometre radius of the insured premises. Um, and that previous concept of a closure um, of the whole or part of the premises by order of a competent authority. Um, so insurers in the UK have argued to the effect that if applied to this, this Australian example, the closure order can't be a community-wide one, but must pertain to a particular location, either the insured premises or some other location within a 20 kilometre radius. Um, to me, and Fred will speak more to this, but to me this is a curious argument for three reasons. Um, number one, it leads to the result that the more widespread the impact of an insured disease, the less cover is afforded under the policy. Um, number two, if, for example, the order is related to a specific city, whether or not there's cover would depend upon the size of the city limits. Um, and number three, the, the clause itself is directed at closure or evacuation because of disease in the area. So the closure or evacuation in these circumstances seems clearly in, intended to impede the spread of the disease. And that's precisely what occurred in respect of the COVID-19 closure orders, which were imposed, for example, upon gyms and pubs. And lastly, in relation to the purpose of the radius, it seems to me the purpose is to impose a geographical limit so that a threshold for claims to be covered is that the disease has actually occurred within that area, rather than to specify that there's no cover if the disease has also occurred outside of that area. But that's a contentious point, particularly in the UK, and, and Fred will speak further to that. So moving on to the Australian Financial Complaints Authority proposed test case. Um, the authority, or AFCA, um, as the acronym is, acts as an external complaint resolution scheme for insurers. Um, and there's monetary limits on its jurisdiction. And in particular, it can't award compensation of more than half a million dollars in these types of claims. And it can't hear complaints involving amounts of more than $1 million. Um, so if your claim gets above that threshold, you can't take it to AFCA. Otherwise, um, if you're within that threshold, complainants aren't obliged to use AFCA, but there's benefits in doing so. It's free. It's generally faster than the court system. AFCA has latitude in how it handles complaints, and in particular, it can make decisions based on notions like fairness. Um, and importantly, it's determinations are binding upon insurers, but not the insureds. Um, we're aware that there are presently more than 20 COVID-19 business interruption insurance cases before AFCA. And AFCA, as I mentioned previously, announced in June that it's considering a test case. And in particular, um, its focus seems to be on the Quarantine Act exclusion. Um, now, in terms of what a test case looks like, um, AFCA's rules permit an insurer to request that a test case is run um, if AFCA agrees and if the insurer agrees to do three things. Number one, it must bring proceedings in a superior court, like the Federal Court or Supreme Court, um, with authority to make a binding decision on, a, on an issue of law, um, and it has to do that within six months. Uh, number two, it has to play, pay the play, uh, complainant's costs of the um, test case and any appeal that the insurer makes from that decision of the Superior Court. And number three, it has to do anything else um, that AFCA requires. So um, in terms of what that looks like, AFCA is presently consulting with stakeholders, but clearly um, insureds or policyholders are going to have a keen interest in ensuring that um, that that case covers the suite of issues that concerns them um, and also that it's done in an expeditious way. Um, so insureds need to watch this space. And with that, I'll hand over now to Fred, who will speak to the more advanced test case position in the UK and provide some further insights. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, well, as indicated, um, there's a test case running in the UK on the uh, 8th, I'm sorry, on the 9th of June 2020, the Financial Conduct Authority commenced proceedings against eight insurers 
and they're uh, just looking at an expected hearing date toward the end of this month. Now, that's a pretty optimistic timetable, I'd venture to suggest, but apparently they're, uh, they don't expect too much slippage. So it's really got the inside track, this case. It's proceeding on the basis of an agreed set of facts and some assumed facts, and they involve seven different categories of industry and various combinations of legislation and regulation and government intervention at different levels and circumstances of loss, which um, <clears throat> provide the, the different scenarios that they want to establish precedent for. Unfortunately, all of, of course, all of this legislation and all of these policy wordings and all of these losses involve situations in the United Kingdom and the precedent value for Australia is limited. But to the extent that there's interpretation of common clauses um, in similar fact situations, the case will have <clears throat> some considerable um, persuasive value or persuasive merit. There's a heavyweight bench been assigned to it. And um, so it'll have some, some influence in Australia, but it won't bind any Australian court or any regulatory authority in Australia. So the wordings, the wordings for the policies that they're looking at are all small to medium enterprise business pack um, uh, commercial insurance, property insurance policies. Um, they're not the large scale fire and perils and industrial special risks Mark 4 and Mark 5 that you usually see um, for Australian major manufacturers and projects and miners and such. So. And the common factor that they all have is that like these SME type policies in Australia, like similar, similarly to the types of policies that Chris has been talking about, they are all involving cover under extensions which permit business interruption, consequential losses to be claimed in the absence of physical damage to the insured's property. Um, it's pretty clear that just having the virus on your tabletop or on your uh, door handle or on your uh, forklift truck uh, ignition switch or whatever is not property damage within the meaning of these policies uh, as that term is used in Australian law. And these insurance contracts all require physical damage to property. So physical damage um, probably doesn't occur where all you have to do is wipe it over with a cloth with some detergent or methylated spirits and the things good as gold again. Some American cases are running where they're arguing that just having the virus in the air in your property amounts to property damage, but that wouldn't get up under the existing state of Australian law or for that matter the United Kingdom's law either. So these cases are all under the sorts of extensions that Chris has been discussing and the test case won't deal with the wider issue of whether business interruption policies could or should respond on a wide scale basis where there's no property damage to physical damage to the insured's property. Uh, the case that the FCA is running is essentially that the legislative and regulatory measures which the UK authorities put in place, um, taken by government and enforced by police and local and municipal authorities, in response to the coronavirus emergency, they meet the trigger for coverage under these policy extensions. And moreover, for the dual purposes of establishing that the business interruption uh, was caused by the insured peril, uh, by the trigger required, by the essential trigger occurrence, and uh, that the trend of the business was that it would have not have suffered losses um, had that not occurred. Um, for both cases, the proper counterfactual, the way the statement of claim pleads it is that for the dual purposes of establishing but for causation the trend and the trend of the business in the counterfactual, the correct counterfactual is a world in which there was no COVID-19 and no government intervention relating to COVID-19, not merely one in, in which the relevant insured business was enabled to keep its doors open while the rest of the community was cowering in lockdown. And that's quite important because the insurer's common defences, some of the insurers have defences that are not available to others, but the common defences that they're all running are essentially three stages. The first stage, they say, prevention of access to insured premises within the meaning of these policies, these extensions, 
requires that the entry to the premises be physically obstructed or specifically forbidden. The targeted intervention, intervention is required by local authorities or police requiring that business to close. Regulations at the national level, say the insurers, which merely frustrate or inhibit commercial or customer activity, frighten people into staying home, <clears throat> don't fall within the requirements, the trigger requirements of the extensions. And to quote the policy again from, this is a quote from one of Zurich's policies, action by police or other competent local civil or military authority following a danger or disturbance at or in the vicinity of the premise, premises resulting in denial of access, the insurers say is required. Mere discouragement or prevention of customers from seeking access is including by even including by locking them in their homes is not denial of access within the meaning of the extensions. And it has to be noted that a number of the regulations in many of the areas in, in the UK that uh, mentioned that are dealt with in the test case, a lot of those regulations and interventions didn't actually require businesses to close. They were allowed to keep trading. The second limb of the insurer's defence is a causation defence, and it's uh, essentially uh, consistent with some UK authority. There's an English case from about 10 years ago, um, a judgment arising out of um, um, an American hotel closure as a result of um, hurricanes Rita and Katrina, I think. Case of Orient Express Hotels versus Generali, and that case is authority for the proposition that causation of an insured loss by an insured peril is on a but-for basis, consistent with some tort law theories of causation. That means essentially that you have to be able to prove that but-for that insured occurrence happening, that peril that's insured against occurring, um, you would not have suffered the loss. If you would have suffered the loss any event, even if that uh, peril had not occurred, then you haven't met the but-for test of causation. And that's the insurer's uh, second argument, because essentially what they're saying is, if everybody's not going to go out at all anyway, um, and everybody's sitting at home, then even if your premises um, was not refused access was not, even if there was perfect, full and free and unfettered access to your premises, you would have still suffered the same trading losses because nobody was trading and you couldn't, you had no customers. And it's analogous to the situation where the earthquake flattens every house in the, in the city except for your factory. Your factory is um, still able to um, continue to trade, um, but it has no business interruption loss because it would have suffered that business interruption loss in any event. That's the set I should have got ahead of myself a bit there because that's the, the third limb of the argument, which relies on the trending clause. And that's a clause that's common to Australian policies as well. Essentially in property damage insurance, it says that for the business interruption cover, the indemnity is discounted for the trend of the business in the counterfactual situation where the insured peril hadn't occurred. So if, for example, you have a fire and you suffer a loss of uh, gross revenue or, and as a result of diminished uh, turnover or output uh, while you're repairing that damage, then you've got a business interruption claim. But if you had plant that was coming to the end of its life or a scheduled maintenance outage or a major um, customer uh, supply contract being completed and no uh, pipeline replacement work to, to follow it, and that was going to happen even if the fire hadn't occurred, then the insurer can discount, they can adjust the indemnity they're required to pay you for the loss of gross profit for that trend of the business factor. So that's the third point that the insurers are raising, that the trends clause means that even if your premises were allowed to keep open, there was no denial of access. The fact was that nobody was coming out and everybody was miserable and nobody had money to spend and unemployment was going sky high. Your business would have been affected anyway and there would have been very little, much or very similar degree of loss. In other words, a lot of this loss would have happened. So those are the three essential arguments that the insurer is running. 
They're saying basically community-wide lockdowns or restrictions imposed by governments at the national level are not the same as denial or restriction of access to particular premises within the meaning of the extensions in the policies. Secondly, they're saying even if they are, even if it is a denial of access, then they're not the proximate cause of the business interruption, since the business interruption would have occurred anyway. It would have been caused by um, other factors. It would have uh, the, the effects on the community of the lockdown would have produced that business interruption in any event, and therefore the trend of the business in the counterfactual scenario is that your indemnity is reduced to compensate, even if there is any loss that you can show was particularly caused and was uniquely specific to you because of your lockdown. Now, those are the common defences that the insurers are raising. Some of the insurers have particular defences of their own. In some cases, they've got exclusions to the effect that um, um, there's a pandemic exclusion, for example, and this is quite interesting because um, some of the wording say anything that's declared to be a pandemic by the World Health Organisation is excluded. Um, now, and that doesn't cover you within the meaning of the notifiable diseases extension. You might remember that the World Health Organisation was a bit slow off the bat in declaring it as a pandemic. The Australian government did so before the WHO got around to it. And so some of these defences will depend upon exactly when the declaration was made and um, whether it um, was a declaration to, to, to that effect within properly made within the meaning of the extension. Some others uh, have got the point that they say for the purposes of their extension, COVID-19 was not a notifiable disease at the time the denial of access took place. Now that might seem counterintuitive. How can it not be a notifiable disease under the circumstances? But in fact, it was only declared to be such by regulation in the UK with effect from the 5th of March this year. So, and there are some agreed facts as to the, in the, in the cases that have been stated as to the date at which COVID-19 in fact became a notifiable disease. And finally, some of these insurers, their extensions are only triggered by diseases, one or more of diseases from a closed list happening at or within a defined radius of the premises. And COVID-19, of course, is not on that closed list because it was only discovered in, uh, in January or whenever it was only named in January. So those are essentially the issues between the parties in this action. And while it's tempting to, and I, I certainly deprecate the position that some of the insurers have been taking with regard to these uh, exclusions, you can't dismiss their defences out of hand. Chris mentioned that the irony of the fact that if you take this line that uh, gov government activity on a wider scale, um, the broader the, uh, the intervention, the wider the effect of the um, authoritarian measures, the less cover there is. That seems unreasonable, but it is in fact quite consistent with insurance theory and with the the, fun, the philosophical premise, if you like, the moral justification to the extent there. There's no moral justification for an insurer that just declines to pay a claim when the claim is covered. Absolutely no doubt about that. But the moral justification for mounting an argument which is legally viable that there's no cover comes from the fact basically that the insurance fundamental principle is that the premiums of the many have to be sufficient to pay for the claims of the few. And Insurance can't work if potentially everyone has a claim. That's why nuclear uh, disasters have always been excluded. That's why uh, war has always been excluded, because these things cause damage and disruption on a scale that only governments can effectively compensate for. The insurance industry says, says that <clears throat> there's a reason why all our, our policy wordings, our extensions are, are intended to be, leaving aside for the moment whether they are in fact or not. Uh, that's a question that will be decided in the cases in the UK and in Australia, but they're intended to be local and specific to the affected insured policyholder. If, my, if your factory burns down or blows up or gets flooded, we will pay you to repair it and we will pay the, uh, the business interruption loss as a result. 
because that's specific to you. We can handle a bit of a, say, a flood or a bushfire because that's still local. It's local on a bigger scale, perhaps, but still local. But what we can't handle is society as a whole being shut down. If we're expected to underwrite for that, then you've got two choices, Mr. Government, Mr. Society, Mr. Social Engineer. You either basically hand us over the job um, and we underwrite for it, in which case insurance has to be basically um, compulsory. Um, either insurance is charged at a, at a premium which is unacceptable to most people or it becomes compulsory for everybody to develop a sufficient premium pool. Or alternatively, we become the tax collectors and we become the disaster administrators, and of course that's not going to work either. That's the insurer's moral justification. The flaw in that argument, though, is from a moral or a philosophical point of view, is that it's equally consistent with a reductio absurdum. You have a situation such as Christchurch or Fukushima or anywhere where there's a wide-scale disaster. If that causation but for argument is run, if that Orient Hotel's principle is pushed to its logical conclusion, then everybody, every business in that air affected area could have business interruption insurance, but none of them would have had a claim because none of their uh, damage would have been suffered but for, would not have been suffered, I should say, but for the interruption to their own business, the impact on, the, on their own premises. So that's really the issues in the matter, and uh, I'll leave it there and um, pan back to Lucy. I think I'm back on. Um, I might just ask our administrator to put Chris and Fred on the screen um, with me so that we can have a bit of a, an open discussion. Um, we haven't had any questions. We've got a shy audience today, but I've definitely got questions. And some of them have come from policyholder clients of mine um, in Melbourne who may have or may have not yet made a claim, but have certainly suffered business interruption losses. So I think, um, you know, one thing that concerns me based on what Chris was talking about with AFCA is um, the timing of these because with AFCA's test cases, AFCA has only announced that there will be test cases um, and we don't know much about that publicly. The UK is well ahead of AFCA in terms of what their test case um, trajectory is looking like. And I just wondered, Chris, whether you had any comments on um, the timing of the AFCA test cases and particularly for AFCA claimants who are, um, I can't remember the figure you mentioned, but there's a number of cases sitting in AFCA at the moment, um, whether AFCA will stay those proceedings um, before, you know, in, in, pending the outcome of the test cases or, or whether you've got any comments on that? Yeah, sure. Um, as I mentioned, the process is still being developed. So what it looks like is still up in the air. So in part, the timing is going to depend upon that. But um, you know, AFCA and the insurers and insurers all have an interest in this being resolved expeditiously. And, and the whole point of the test case is that it will test specific points of law, um, which is typically something that a court, um, a superior court like a federal court, will be able to do in a much quicker fashion than it would for a, a full-blown litigation. So it's not going to be resolving underlying factual issues or you know, broader issues. As Fred's mentioned, it'll, it'll be focused on very specific issues. So I think people can expect once the process has been uh, developed and agreed, if indeed it is, um, that that will will happen in a condensed time frame. Of um, I, I mentioned um, that the the insurers have to get it on within six months. I think it'll be quicker than that. Um, perhaps a bit ambitious to think it'll be as quick as what's happened in the UK. Um, and the the other point I make to your uh, the, the part of your question about well what happens with other cases. Well, I think. 
that depends. If they're cases which um, are which involve points of law which are exactly the same as the points of law which are going to be determined through the test case, then then yes, I'd fully expect that AFCA will um, not decide those cases until um, that test case is played out. That's that's the point of the the test case process. But um, if there are other cases which don't fall within that rubric, then perhaps there's still scope for those to be um, determined in the meantime. Mm. And you also mentioned the remit of AFCA um, and the scope. So obviously, um, not every policyholder can go to AFCA with their complaint, particularly um, if the quantum of their business interruption loss is really significant. Um, in that case, um, presumably, you know, we've been advising policyholders to put your claim in, make sure you're reserving your rights. Um, and, and keep an eye on the test cases. But let's look at a scenario where the UK test cases power on and in Australia we haven't had any determinations as yet. Um, I'm thinking maybe a couple of months. And um, let's say the UK test cases are resolved and we have some decisions by the UK courts on, on specific points. I just want to hand to Fred and just ask Fred, how persuasive do you think that would be for an Australian policyholder if they had the same or similar wording and they took that off to court in Australia? Uh, reasonably persuasive, Lucy, if the wordings were the same. Uh, but of course, every, any case can be distinguished on its factual circumstances. You'd need to have uh, a corresponding scenario across language and facts and losses. But it, uh, they've set, they're sitting a fairly heavyweight bench. Mr Justice Flo, who is a uh, uh, eminent uh, insurance lawyer, highly regarded in the UK, is, is on it. I can't remember who the other two are. Um, but they're all very experienced insurance lawyers. They're not taking this lightly or anything. And uh, So the, uh, the High Court of Judicature in London has definitely fielded its A-team for this. Um, one thing I'd observe, I, I would expect Put it this way, I, I, I would, if it's a carefully reasoned decision, which we, we can expect it will be, um, it will be fairly strong persuasive authority. It'd have to be very different legislation. The random card of factor, of course, is that the Insurance Contracts Act uh, can, is there's a different legislative regime in Australia from the UK, and so. Not only may the words of the policy be a bit different, but they may have a slightly different effect in Australian law as well. So that's another that's a factor to be taken into account. And the other point I'd make, which is perhaps not not directly on line with your uh, question, but evolves from it, is even if say we get some test cases in Australia, if some if AFCA permits a number of test cases to go to the federal court. When you're, you as a policyholder are looking at your policy, bear in mind that the test cases that went to court were the ones selected by the insurers. Now, if an insured has a pretty strong claim, chances are AFCA will find in its favour, in the insured's favour. And if AFCA finds in the insured's favour, um, the insurer has to accept that. And usually, usually uh, although AFCA tends to favour policyholders, a bit more than the courts perhaps might. Nevertheless, uh, it's usually reasonably objective. And if uh, the insured has failed at AFCA, um, it's a fairly brave lawyer that says, well, have a punt in the federal court because they might be a bit more friendly towards you. Um, chances are the, the good legal, the sound legal advice that insured would get would be don't go to the court. You, AFCA says you haven't got a claim, hasn't cost you anything to find that out. So suck it up and take the treat it as a lesson and uh, buy a better policy next year. Um, if a case, if the insurer has basically selected a case and asked AFCA for permission to take it to court, it's either a very tricky area, it's either a, a, an area where AFCA itself is going to be very well disposed to giving permission because it wants a precedent, wants some judge to deal with this hard question to give it uh, something it can rely on, or it's one where the insurer thinks it can win in court, and AFCA is likely to, have to if, it, if AFCA decided it, it would be likely to decide in the insurer's favour. So the insurer is saying, well, let's get, let's take this one along, 
and the AFCA again. AFCA's not basically um, in the business of advocacy for policyholders. That's not its role. It's part of its job is basically to decide disputes, and it needs some case law. And this is a new area, so you wouldn't blame AFCA if it waved the insurers through to take a number of cases where the insurers have strong defences to a claim to the court. So the point I'm getting at is just because the test case goes against you doesn't mean that your policy, your claim, necessarily has no legs. Look at it in each case on its merits. I guess one other thing that um, I've heard floating around in terms of dealing with any broad COVID-19 exclusions on policies on renewal, um, on policies, not just business interruption policies, I've seen them slapped on DNO policies, on um, broad general liability policies, and on the ISR and business interruption policies. Um, if we're looking at a world where there may be very limited or even no insurance offered for um, losses or liabilities flowing from pandemics, do you think there would be a role for um, a similar function to the ARPC, Fred, in terms of, um, for those of you in the audience who haven't heard of the ARPC, it's the Australian Reinsurance Pool Corporation. And that's essentially a catastrophic loss um, pool structure where the government realised post 9-11 that terrorism risks were no longer going to be covered by the insurance um, industry and that something had to be done. So if pandemic insurance is no longer available in future, do you see the government maybe looking at something like that, despite the cash that they've splashed around with JobKeeper and everything else lately? Quite possibly. And on the subject of splashing cash around, they've got to get it back. And I might add the ARPC has been a nice little earner for the federal government for, uh, 20, for 18, 19 years. Um, was raided at one stage by one government, I think, about in 2010, didn't they raid the reserves of the ARPC? Um, so. It's been hopefully built up again since then. But yes, that's possible, Lucy. But um, I wouldn't, if I was the, I, the Insurance Council, I'd be a bit wary of advocating for that. And I'd be telling my members, look, it's all very well slapping on pandemic exclusions. We had, uh, uh, we've had uh, data recognition exclusions where we'll, next thing we'll, we're having uh, um, electronic interference and social engineering exclusions. And the more and more exclusions you try to slap on policies, the more that you narrow the coverage, you, there's getting an in, uh, increasingly shrinking area of risk available for private underwriting and an correspondingly shrinking premium pool. And if the insurance industry tries to exclude too much, it can basically um, exclude itself half out of business. And they're seeding, they will be seeding an awful lot of potentially lucrative territory at the right price and with the right data, key to it is data, to the governments. Once they create a, a or back out of a situation and allow the government essentially to take it over, in Australia you might have a philosophic government that's philosophically designed to bow out of private enterprise as soon as it can, although they said they were going to do that with the ARPC, but it uh, hasn't happened. And in other parts of the world, governments would be only too happy to take over the role of uh, risk management of last resort and charging the premiums accordingly. The key to it is whether the when a new risk comes along, when something like COVID-19 or the effect, and the pandemics are not new, it goes back, there's been plagues since Babylon times, basically. What's, what's required is getting a handle on the loss frequency and magnitude. Once you've got enough losses of enough frequency and you've evaluated and you've got enough data points to assess those two factors, frequency and magnitude, then you can run a few triangulations, you can run a few Monte Carlo simulations, the law of large numbers kicks in, and you've got a basis for scientific underwriting. You can do it a number of ways, but if you don't want to wait that long, you can try Bayesian uh, projections and, and underwrite on the basis of uh, updating posterior probabilities. The point is, once there's that sufficient amount of information, what was a threat previously, and oh, we better exclude it because we haven't taken premium for it, now it's a business opportunity. So the insurers don't want to uh, shut themselves off too quickly from that business opportunity by reflexingly excluding everything 
creating a mindset where adds to their disapproval rating in the community. And though I hate the term, they jeopardise their social licence to operate um, and see government taking over the role before they have to. So it's a question of striking a balance between this issue that they can't cover catastrophic losses which, which affect the whole of society um, because they haven't taken the premium sufficient to build the reserves for that. But at the same time, they don't want to narrow their scope of business too much uh, out of preemptive fear. So yeah. yes, there's a role, Lucy, but uh, I'd be I'd say the insurance industry is down, but I wouldn't count them out yet. Yeah, we've had a question through um, about reinsurance. Actually, what about insurers recovering from their reinsurance programs? Are the exclusions similar in their reinsurance treaties? I'll come clean here. I haven't seen any reinsurance treaties for clients in this context. Have you, Chris or Fred? Not yet, uh, but there could well be a VASA, a VASA v. Lexington problem here. Uh, yeah. um, <clears throat> Lucy and I call it the mind the gap pro the, the mind the gap problem, where your local policy that you've issued covers uh, the loss because of the wording that it's on or because of the way some court interprets that wording, or God help us, because some, some gung-ho legislature decides to pass some retrospective act that invalidates or strikes down that wording and says there's cover, and you get stuck with that. But then you look at the reinsurance treaty and you find the reinsurance treaty is subject to a, um, a different uh, law of a different jurisdiction and um, is construed or has different wording. It, it may have a different wording or it may have the same wording but subject to a different jurisdiction's laws and doesn't provide cover. And then you've got a gap between your obligation to your policyholder and your, your claim as a cedent on your reinsurance. Now that is a per perennial risk for insurers and it's something that they're very mindful of. Uh, it's certainly an issue in play in the uh, in the American jurisdictions where there's been the threat of um, of legislation modifying exclusions or striking down exclusions and the part of the response will be well unless you can bring these reinsurers within the jurisdiction Mr State Governor you're going to have an insolvent insurance company on your hands and you may be prepared to be the insurer of last resort for that because we'll just go chapter 11 and that's what they'll probably, some of them may have to do. But I don't think, I think that sanity will prevail before that goes too far. What is interesting is you have a situation like the Bermuda form, which is quite a common form of reinsurance treaty, which essentially provides for the uh, policy and the insurance contract itself and the underlying policy and the reinsurance contract, both to be governed by the law of New York which is generally quite black letter and rigorous, um, but subject to arbitration with an arbitration clause providing for arbitration in London to make sure they don't get some good old boy panel of arbitrators in a southern state or whatever. Now, that's my little nod toward American racism, if you like. Um, that, how that will play out in claim disputes will be very interesting over the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm very mindful of time. Um, we're coming to an end, but I might just leave with um, a comment which is quite interesting from one of our attendees today from the VMIA saying that on the reinsurance front, they're seeing reinsurers impose full exclusions or offering limited write backs in regards to communicable disease extensions. There's no consistency across the market, which is frustrating to manage to truly understand any gap in cover. And I think that's unfortunately reflective of where we're at at the moment, um, that there is still a lot of confusion in the market and it may be some time before we get the clarity that we'd all like, um, particularly as policyholders whose claims may be the be all and end all of their businesses. Um, but obviously, you know, the message today is hang in there and um, the extent that you think you do have a policy entitlement get in there and reserve your rights and make your claim to the extent that you can, irrespective of any polite denial of indemnity that you get from your insurer. Um, one of my clients just the other day was invited to withdraw their claim. Um, and, I, and we said no. 
So um, feel free to stand your ground and thank you very much for attending today. It's been a real pleasure. Um, it's been a bit of a learning experience for us at Clayton Utes with technology, but I think our Blue Jeans platform has served us really well today. And just a very brief shout out to everyone in the audience that we are having a bit of a follow-on follow from this discussion focusing on DNO insurance in the coming weeks, um, where we'll have a bit of a chat about not only um, DNO in a COVID world, but also some of the other market factors that are keeping us all awake at night on the DNO um, front. So thank you very much for coming along today and enjoy your afternoon.